So where in the world will Tom take us tonight? Well, he has been all across the country exploring our changing planet, and he's back with another view from space. Hey, Tom. Yes. Well, guys, you know, last night we showed you the changing landscape in Alaska. Tonight, our series continues at the epicenter of Earth science in this country. Climate change is tricky. It's something we don't see signs of every day outside our window, but it's going on. And a host of scientists are watching very closely and tracking every shift with centimeter precision. We got an up-close look at their work and the incredible instruments they use to study our planet. This is part two of our forecast of fragile climate. Our climate exploration brought us to our nation's capital. And ultimately, to space. When you think of NASA, you think of rocket launches. But at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, here outside of Washington, D.C., one of the major focuses is on Earth and what's happening here. There's a lot of serious work here. This is where you and NASA build a number of your satellites. Yes, indeed. We build not only the satellites that carry our instruments, but the instruments themselves. Oceanographer Jeremy Wardell showed us around the massive facility. When you tie all of these instruments together, it is a beautiful look at our home planet. Which is particularly relevant at a time when our climate is changing and indeed you're getting a handle on exactly how. It is, it is my project it does exactly that. His mission, called PACE, will help scientists integrate observations of the atmosphere and the ocean. And here it is, the uh, PACE satellite under development and construction here at Goddard. Exactly. And exactly. this will be launched from the Kennedy Space Center. Cape Canaveral on a Falcon Cape 9 Canaveral. in January 2024. The work here is powered by the collective minds of thousands. We came to meet a few in particular. People got hung up on this kind of thing, yeah. oddly enough. They're Doctors not to, like, Tom Newman and Kelly Brunt are University of Chicago educated scientists who have studied the cryosphere, ice covered regions of the world for more than two decades. When lay people talk to us about climate change, they often incorporate the word believe. Do you believe in climate change? And the first thing I want to do is have you guys take the word believe out of your lexicon. This is science, there's no room for belief. What we're doing is measuring, and what we talk about instead of belief is confidence or errors. So we have statistical confidence in the data that we're collecting to say that this is meaningful change in our ice sheets, this is meaningful change in our sea ice. They help lead a mission called ISAT-2 and interpret its findings. It basically measures the height of everything on Earth. ISAT-2 is a satellite 300 miles above Earth. It's constantly circling the planet along the same 1,387 flight lines. The laser on ISAT-2 transmits 10,000 pulses per second. So in a long track sense, that's a shot on the ground every 70 centimeters. Elevations are determined based on the time it takes a beam of laser light to hit a surface and bounce back to the satellite. The height of cities, buildings, and trees can all be measured with centimeter precision. But as the name suggests, it's really optimized to measure the changes in ice sheets and sea ice and glaciers. It's wicked cool. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. Dr. Brunt has been fascinated by snow and ice since childhood. As a kid, our family vacations were ski trips, and so in my head, you know. Jumping around on white stuff was, sure. was the good thing to do. <laughs> she uses the massive amount of data sent down from ISAT-2 to study what are known as the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. How big is Antarctica? It's a little bit bigger than the continental United States. Our ice sheets are kind of in jeopardy because they're in touch with both our warming atmosphere and our warming ocean. The red and yellow represent areas that are melting. There's a lot of water tied up in that, and that could really affect our oceans That's and right. levels in our oceans. That's right. The consensus among glaciologists, Dr. Brunt says, is diminishing ice sheets will contribute three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. There's some slowness to that that we can work with. I'm talking about engineers, thinking about maybe how we Think about what's on our coastlines and bring it back a little bit. But there's another swath of ice that's generating more immediate concern. 
Boy, if there's one animation that kind of tells the story, here's one of them. This is our Arctic sea ice pack. What's called sea ice, the cap of frozen ocean waters, is shrinking in the Arctic. The other horrible part of it is that it's also getting thinner. You can't create four-year sea ice in one season. So we're losing our old thick ice. The comparison from 1985 to 2019 is stunning. You can see the old ice represented in white disappearing. So let me ask you, why is this important? The sea ice provides a cap over the Arctic Ocean and it regulates that interchange between the ocean and the atmosphere of heat, you know, either back and forth. And when you start making changes like that, you start to govern your weather patterns in the Arctic, and that ultimately translates down to our mid-latitudes, towards Chicago. So changes in our Arctic sea ice have an impact everywhere on global weather patterns, and that is super meaningful. Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum studies how storms intensify as our planet is warming. One of the things we're trying to understand about hurricanes is how they rapidly intensify, like Hurricane Ida or Hurricane Maria, how they went from a category one to a category five storm in less than 24 hours. So what we're seeing is that the nature of what creates storms and makes them intensify, the warming sea surface temperatures, for example, or the winds, those shifts are having meaningful impacts on storms. She spoke with us about NASA's Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM, which has tracked change in rainfall over a 20-year period. So if you think about Hurricane Harvey, which really moved into Texas and it just yes. sat and took all of that warm ocean water from the Gulf and then dropped 40 inches of rain in Texas, those types of events, these slow-moving, rapidly intensifying events are signatures of how our climate is changing and how storms are manifesting in this new environment that we're experiencing change in. We're just at the beginning of what we're going to be seeing over the over the coming decades. Atmospheric scientist Don Wobbles has spent half a century making climate observations, not from space, but right here in the Midwest. This isn't just the warming. The warming is important part of it, but it's the changes in severe weather, extreme weather events. We had major floods in Kentucky. We've seen the heat waves in Europe this summer. The heat waves in the western part of the U.S. The University of Illinois Professor Emeritus says we're at a critical juncture. We basically have three choices relating to climate. We can mitigate, reduce emissions. We can adapt or be more, be more resilient. Or we can suffer. And right now we're doing some of all three. And we need to do a lot of mitigation and a lot of adaptation if we're going to reduce that suffering for the future. Later this month, NASA is set to launch another Earth absorbing, uh, observing satellite that will help us plan for severe weather and track global climate change. The massive amount of data they collect is all shared freely with researchers, students, and lay people around the world. Now we have one last stop on our climate adventure tomorrow in part three of our series. We'll take you out west to Lake Mead outside Las Vegas, our nation's largest reservoir that supplies 40 million people with water. Water levels are at historic lows and have been for several years. We'll show you the conditions out there and what may be the largest climate adaption program in the world. That's tomorrow in our final installment of Forecast of Fragile Climate. And I urge you to watch this because yeah. I, the video, we went out on the lake with a uh, charter captain. Mm. It has dropped the level of that lake, which is, provides 90% of Las Vegas' water, uh, by 170 feet, 17 mm. stories down since 2000 alone. Uh, and they've got some real issues up there. It's at 27% capacity. How would you like to have your water source at 27% capacity? Mm. Makes us look uh, with great appreciation at the great lakes 20% of the world's fresh water that sits outside right. our very doorstep here in for sure. Chicago. Yeah. Reporting near and dear to your heart and we're the better for it. So Tom, we appreciate it. Thank you. And Thank you can you. catch all of the stories in one place. You can tune in to our special WGN Films presentation of a fragile climate this Friday at 7 p.m. It'll also stream on WGN Plus, which you can find on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV.